Good evening and welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Remote. I'm Elizabeth from Gibson's Bookstore and I am joined this evening by author Rick Tyler, who is the author of Still Right, an immigrant loving, hybrid driving, composting American makes the case for conservatism. He is joined by friend and fellow author John Clark. Good evening, gentlemen. Welcome to Gibson's. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks for having us. It's an honor to be one of America's greatest independent bookstores. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for saying that. First of all, um, I will mention as one of America's great independent bookstores, this book is available from Gibson's. We do happily ship books all over the country, all over the world. Or if you are local, we do offer in-store browsing and curbside pickup right now. Um, so tell me a little bit about this book, Rick. So. I knew I, wanted to write, I knew I wanted to write a book. I always wanted to write a book, and I have lots of ideas for books, but I had to have the first book, and the first book, so if you don't like this book, I won't be writing any others, but if you do like this book, I have lots of books <laughs> in my head. Um, and I wrote actually a different proposal to the publisher, and, and um, I got rejected by lots of publishers, like a lot of authors do, and, but I had one publisher who came to me from uh, St. Martin's Press, and he worked for Thomas Dune Books. His name is Stephen Power. And I have to say, if it wasn't for Stephen, I don't think this book would have began because he did what is unheard of in the published industry. He actually uh, edited my proposal, critiqued it, and sent it back to me. <laughs> and, and literally said, because normally that does not happen. Uh, and he said, Rick, if you write this book, I will publish it. And I said, I, I don't have the stature to write that book. And just because I just thought it was, a, it's a really, it, to me, it's such a weighty, heavy topic. And so many people are so educated on uh, conservative thought that I just didn't put myself in that category. And he says, you can do this book and, and I'm going to help you do it. And so I um, put together a draft and, and, and I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce John, John Clark, and he's joining us from, from uh, sunny Florida. Um, John is someone we normally meet in a coffee shop. Um, so meeting a bookstore is actually sort of appropriate. And, you know, we always discuss ideas and we have, you know, robust debate and collaboration about ideas. And so we normally meet in a book, bookshop. But when I got the deal to do the book, I approached him and, and said, you know, what do you think? And he really just uh, was engaged. So John has been really a partner in this whole uh, book I because I felt, as I say, I felt intimidated and in having him help me think through all these concepts. And there really isn't a chapter here that John didn't uh, help me shape. Um, but I wanted to write it for two reasons. One is conservatism is often bashed in the media, uh, particularly on the, um, to the center left or the liberal left likes to bash conservatism. And that always kind of hurt my feelings. <laughs> and because with the things that they say about it, I just knew that they weren't, too, they weren't true. And, and I wanted to set down a marker of that conservatism is a rational governing philosophy that's actually an attractive governing philosophy. And, and I would throw out an olive branch to my friends on the left and say, progressivism is a rational and can be presented as a very attractive governing philosophy. It's not my philosophy. My philosophy is conservatism. Um, but I don't know that it serves anyone well to trash each other's philosophy, when in the end, we, we have so much to agree on. And our country is, is a constitutional republic. And what that means is to get anything done at all, you have to compromise with people who have different ideas than you. In the same way that if you want to vote for somebody who you agree with 100% of the time, you should run. Um, so that's, that's one half of the audience. The other half were actually people who, who self-identify as conservatives, but seem to be more and more embracing policy that are, policies that are just antithetical to conservatism. And I wanted to lay down that marker as well. Uh, so the people who, and of course, for people who are unfamiliar with conservatism at all, either because they're young or they just haven't paid attention to governing philosophy, uh, I think this book lays it out pretty well. Um, it's, uh, I don't, I think I define conservatism actually the way John does, and he says it's ordered liberty. Ordered liberty in the sense that if you take away the ordered, you just get liberty, and that really, that's a libertarian philosophy which is not my philosophy, it's ordered liberty. That is, we don't automatically reject ideas because they're new. We test those ideas against established ideas. And if they're better, we can migrate to them. But if they're not, we wouldn't throw out something that's 
working very, very well for something that might not work very, very well or isn't working very, very well. Um, so I make, those, I make that case on immigration, on trade, on um, health care, uh, on the Second Amendment, uh, and, and, and many of the issue, other issues that are in the book. So that's, that's kind of, that's, that was my motivation for writing Still Right. By the way, still right. John came up with the title too. You know, we just couldn't think of a title, and we had all these ideas. And he says, "You got to call it still right." And I said, "That I think that works." And the reason it's still right is because I'm an MSNBC political analyst, and so I get accused often of going to the enemy. You know, I'm I'm, I'm on MSNBC. Although I dare say uh, there are more conservatives who appear regularly on MSNBC than do on any of the other cable news networks, um, and. One of the reasons I like to be on MSNBC is I, I had to learn how to present a conservative case to a liberal, a, a liberal left-leaning audience. Um, and I think over time, it's been pretty successful. I think that uh, while I haven't convinced everybody who watches the network that they should embrace conservatism, uh, I get a lot of comments that, you know what, I didn't really know what conservatism was, and at least now I understand it. It has a rationale. Um, and so being accused of you know, being a lefty, and I am a Trump critic, and being a Trump critic, they, they say, oh, you've gone over to the left. And I said, no, I'm, I'm still right. So I thought the title fit. And then, of course, the immigrant-loving, hybrid-driving, composting American, which is all true. I, I, I think uh, we should be a pro-immigration country. I do actually drive a hybrid, and I love uh, technologies that, that do to protect the environment. I have a whole chapter on, on the environment. Uh, and we compost here at the Tyler household and we make two to three yards of dirt a year, which we use in our organic gardening. So, um, and I don't, I never thought that that is a liberal idea. I thought that was a, actually a conservation idea. I will say our, our local town operates on a pay as you throw garbage removal where you pay mm -hmm. per garbage bag and composting has reduced our household garbage output by a third. So if that, anything- Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Wow. So um, I will take this moment to say, so you've just given us your credentials, Rick. John, tell us a little bit about yourself and conservatism. So just briefly, um, Rick and I actually met, I think we were working on a campaign and uh, I have worked as a speechwriter uh, for a few candidates, um, everywhere from the local level to the national level. So I think Rick, uh, we met, we were working on a campaign, worked together. Uh, my background, I have, uh, degree in political science and economics, and I ran an investment firm for about 18 years. And so uh, I sold my company about 10 years ago uh, to my business partner, and I wanted to get into more of the writing side, because I thought that conservatism wasn't getting a very fair hearing, uh, and I thought I could maybe help a little bit with that. So uh, I can bring my finance, what I learned on that side of it, to the economic side of these arguments. And, and as I say, I don't think they're presented well. I'm hoping what this book can accomplish is that we start a conversation because we, we used to try to win the hearts and minds. Um, we, we wanted to really know what it is that we believed. I think one of the fun things for me about writing is, is, is sort of stress testing my own ideas. Do they work? I mean, so, um, but I'm hoping what, what this does is it starts a conversation because I think right now the political environment is such that we just shout each each other down. And that really doesn't help anybody. And I don't claim to have all the answers by far. And, and, and uh, you know, I think that, you know, over time, I think my ideas have changed. And I think that's a, that's a healthy thing. I think that's, that's, that's a positive sign. And I, like I say, I'm hoping that that it does start a conversation. What I'm edified by seeing in the reviews for Rick's book is that people that are saying, I'm a lifelong Democrat, but I don't really see much I disagree with in this book. So I think that's good. And I think it's a good sign that it's starting a conversation. Well, being willing to have a conversation is a very good thing. Whereas shutting yourself off and having emotional, you know, making your choices emotionally on a, a rational subject can be sure. problematic. So um, Rick, did conservatism need to be redefined and for, Persons who may be joining us seeking to learn, can you briefly define conservatism for people who may have had a different idea about it? Well, as I say, in a nutshell, I mean, William F. Buckley never actually defined conservatism. I think you can go back to the writings of, of William Burke, and there are a lot of great uh, conservative writers 
which is, as I mentioned before, I was a little intimidated to, intimidated to write this book because I didn't, I didn't feel the stature to be in that zone, but I, I really wanted to lay down, a, a, and I don't define conservatism per se. Um, conservatism is, as we talked about earlier, is, is, is ordered liberties. The idea that, uh, is, is that freedom, individual freedom matters. And, and, you know, it's in our Declaration of Independence, Jefferson wrote life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And he puts them in those, that order because liberty is of precious little use to people who don't have life. And it's very hard to pursue happiness if, you, if, you don't, if you're not free. And, and that combination, and that government, by the way, was supposed to protect those things in, those order, in that order, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that protection of, and particularly the pursuit, uh, has made America by far one of the wealthiest, most prosperous nations in the world. And, and we're having an argument about that. Um, what does that mean? And I do think conservatives do a, a, an okay job of explaining the economic side. We don't always, we don't always explain uh, how conservatism addresses uh, some of the problematic sides of, of of our American society, for instance, people who are in need, and we ought, we get people who are sort of glib and dismissive. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and you know, be independent and, and work hard, and, and all those things are true. But you know, there are people who are just never going to be independent, and they are always, they are always going to need help. Um, and we don't often explain, uh, you know, the idea of decentralized government could actually help people. Um, so. Uh, conservatism, in a nutshell, I'll tell you a little story. It's, it's, it's about Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who's probably the greatest politician of the 20th century. I don't think he really had a rival. And Roosevelt was running uh, right after uh, Woodrow Wilson. Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was a Democrat, and he was loyal to Woodrow Wilson. And he was going to run as a Democrat. His fifth cousin, though, he, he, he modeled his political career after. That was Teddy Roosevelt. And Teddy was a progressive. And FDR was also a progressive, but he had a problem. He, he couldn't run as a Republican because Hoover was a Republican and Hoover was in the middle of, a, of an economic collapse. So that was out. He couldn't run as a progressive because under Woodrow Wilson, progressivism had taken a really ugly turn. Uh, and it stems from eugenics, uh, which was the so-called settled science that we could actually decide uh, who gets to procreate and, and who didn't. And that was a very ugly time. Progressivism also brought us the women's right to vote, so that was a good thing. But it also brought us um, popular elections of, of, of U.S. senators, and I, I think, on balance, that was a bad thing because it cut the uh, it cut the um, uh, responsibility or uh, or the leverage the state legislatures used to have over the U.S. Congress. It just eliminated it, so state legislatures, Congress can pass all these laws that state legislatures continually have to deal with. And they literally have no leverage um, to push back. In the old days, they would have said, Senator, you keep passing that stuff on us, we're gonna send you, we're gonna bring you right back home. Uh, and that, that, that's not the case anymore. And finally, they, they passed um, uh, prohibition right in the middle of prosperous times, if you can imagine. You know, the roaring 20s and everybody's having a wonderful time and they passed prohibition. So FDR couldn't run as a, as a progressive as he really wanted to. And, and, and Wilson was a progressive. In fact, Teddy and, Wilson and, and Woodrow Wilson ran against each other, both with competing uh, progressive agendas, but from different parties. Um, and, you know, Wilson, out, Wilson cleaned his clock. Uh, Taft was the third candidate, even though he was a major party candidate. Um, he got his clock cleaned. And, but FDR did something really interesting. What he did was he put out a progressive agenda, but he didn't call it progressive. You know what he called it? He called it liberal, which is interesting because up until that point, the word liberal and liberalism had been associated with what we now recognize as conservatives. Uh, so that's where the word classic liberal comes from. John and I would identify ourselves as classic liberals uh, in the pre-Roosevelt uh, sense. Uh, but he just stole the word and just called it liberal and it stuck. And the conservatives ended up calling themselves conservatives, and that's been the monikers of the major political philosophies in our country um, ever since. And, and I would argue what's happening now is, you know, Trump calls himself a conservative. He's not. It's demonstrable that he's not. And unfortunately, many people who follow him call themselves conservative, and they're not. I mean, consider the Republican Party just had their convention, and they, 
they, for the first time since 1856, in which nine of the six planks in the original Republican Party platform were civil rights planks. And for the next hundred years, the Republican Party was the pro-civil rights party. They've lost that. And this year, they didn't put out a platform at all, as if to say, we don't know what we believe. And they simply passed a resolution that says, we're with the big guy, and whatever he says, is, we're, we're behind. And I think that's a really sad thing, because parties can't sustain themselves on, the person, on, on a personality. In the same way that in Israel politics, parties come and go with their leaders. If Bibi Netanyahu were to pass from, from uh, the public stage, um, his party, Likud party, I believe, would collapse because there's nothing under it except for Bibi Netanyahu. And the Republican Party is now the, the Trump party. And, and when he moves on one way or the other, um, it will collapse because it's based on one person. Parties need to be based on ideas because when we win, and I spent my career helping the Republicans win, when we win, my question now is, what do we win? What do we actually get? And if the answer is higher deficits, trade tariffs, um, mismanagement of a, of, a, of a national public health crisis that ends up costing us trillions of dollars and millions of lost jobs, um, that's not winning to me. I, I, I would like to return uh, to tried and true philosophy of governing and conservatives have always been sort of at the kids table, even if they, if they were ever invited to dinner, they would got to sit at the kids table. When Reagan came in, they got to sit at the adults table and they drove the agenda for quite a number of years. Now we don't even get invited to dinner and a bunch of them, I would call imposters, sit at the dinner table and call themselves conservative while people like John and I are not even allowed to come, come to dinner. So, so um, that's, that's, well, that's, that's, that's kind of where I think we are uh, in a nutshell and why conservatism, I think, really needs to, to revisit it. And even if you read my book and you don't become a conservative, that's okay. Uh, my goal is accomplished that you say, well, you know what, I, at least I understand why he's a conservative and I understand his thinking on how it works, whether I believe it works or not, that's one thing. But, but at least you'll know that it is a rational theory. So you mentioned earlier that your work as an analyst on MSNBC forced you to examine your own beliefs in depth. And they do say that to teach is to learn. So mm -hmm. is, is for yourself as well, John, does teaching people, did that definitely reinforce your own beliefs or did it change them? Well, it's funny, you know, cause I, I have uh, nine children, uh, amazingly enough. And uh, I homeschooled them. I've homeschooled all of them. And what's interesting is, is that, Probably one of the greatest preparations for writing speeches um, is, is, is teaching my children and explaining concepts to them. Um, so I think there's that, but I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that's the, the Socratic principle, right? It's, it's impossible to separate teaching from learning. And, and as I say, when we have these conversations, the thing for me from a conservative perspective is, is that much of what we believe is, is that the, the, the private sector is able to come up with many of these solutions. I, I think Rick did really uh, an amazing job in the environmental chapter because he's explaining his that that's his life, and uh, you know that's the way that he's living his life. And and the reality of it is he's not saying, hey, it, conservatives are sort of painted with the brush of we don't care about the environment. That's that's clearly not the case. We're making the argument that conservatism, the private sector, might simply be the best way to address this as opposed to leaving it in government hands. And, you know, again, I think that many of the uh, areas addressed in this book essentially make that claim is that things may be better addressed. It's not that we don't care about these things. Of course we do. We're just trying to figure out the best way to get there. We're, we're trying to achieve the common good, presumably the same as the prog uh, political progressives. We're just arguing about maybe the map in terms of how to get there, if that makes sense. And yourself, Rick? I was so enthralled with John's answer, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> Re-examining your own beliefs in order oh, right. to convey them, does that help reinforce your own belief? When you're Absolutely. I mean, when you, have to when you have to explain to other people what you believe, and, and I'll, I'll give you two examples. I mean, when I first went on MSNBC, I started really going on the Chris Matthews show. 
Now, John and I have been watching Chris Matthews. We've been watching Chris Matthews for as long as there have, literally as long as there's been cable television. Like, you know, he was a legend. And Chris Matthews actually worked on the Hill. He worked for three separate congressmen. Uh, he was actually a Capitol Hill police officer before, before he actually worked on the Hill in politics. And I always had respect for Chris because he doesn't pontificate because he just pontificates. He pontificates because he actually worked for the Speaker of the House and worked in the Speaker's office. Um, that, that's the experience you can't, you can't trade. And so I was invited on a show, Hardball, for the first time. And uh, it, was very, it, it was very intimidating. So my goal with Chris Matthews on Hardball was, um, you know, get invited back, like to survive it. And Chris was very generous. And over the years, I kept getting invited back more and more. But when I first started MSNBC, I was the person th on there that people love to hate, right? And so there's, so we, we all have those people. We watch because we can't take their eyes off of them because we just hate them so much, right? <laughs> they're just enjoyable and entertaining because, you know, they're nuts. And, and that was me. I would argue uh, and love to argue, uh, but I wasn't very likable. And then over time, I decided, and I've worked on a presidential camp, several presidential campaigns, that if I was ever going to be effective in promoting the conservative philosophy, I was going to have to learn how to convince people that it was, re it was reasonable. And so I had to learn how to speak to people who didn't believe what I believed um, and find common ground. And I think that's worked very well. And, and as John said, you know, he's read the reviews. But I've talked to people who've read the book, and they are just very surprised. In fact, uh, I've had conversations with people who read the book and said, you know, I, I, there was just so much in here I, I didn't understand. I didn't know. I didn't know. And 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 that's been very gratifying. And again, it's it's all about starting the conversation. Um, I also taught people how to run for elected office to thousands of people all over the world, Israel, Rome, the Greece, to most Canada, mostly the United States. Um, and you really got to think it through. And when, when Stephen Power, who the one who wrote my original, rewrote my, my failed proposal, um, when I sent him the initial manuscript, you know, he, I can't remember what he had, uh, it was 7,000 words of questions. Like, <laughs> like that's Lincoln at Cooper Union speech length quite a number of questions <laughs> that that is a long and i it was it was hard because i really had to think very deeply about um health care people who don't have insurance um people with pre-existing conditions um how to reconcile my second amendment rights with uh fred gutenberg who i write about uh who endorsed the book by the way fred gutenberg if you don't know who he is he lost his daughter at Parkland um, High School uh, in Florida. And um, so I write about him. And, and so in every chapter, I try to think of some of, I was once, I was already accused of putting out, um, you know, straw men. And that, that wasn't my intention. I, 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 I did not want to put out straw men. I wanted to answer questions that had been asked of me uh, and how I answered them. So I tried to take what, progressives ask is really hard questions for conservatives to answer. And I wanted to answer them. And I wanted to start there. And it was, it was also a mark, uh, it was a crass marketing theory too. Here's the theory. If I could start a chapter where they're nodding their head yes for the first three pages, as opposed to throwing my book across the room, then I might have a chance to actually get to the ideas and they might finish the chapter. If I could just do some storytelling uh, connect with them at the beginning of the chapter that they might read the rest of the chapter where it might get a little hard going. And I think that strategy might have paid off. Well, I will take this moment to remind people that the book is available from Gibson's Bookstore. We are including signed book plates with all purchases of the book from Gibson's Bookstore, which Rich was, Rick was very kind to send to us. Thank you very much. Um, so can you tell me some of your biggest frustrations about how and political conservatism has been changed by per public perception through the Republican Party? Well, yeah, there's a lot of issues there. Um, let me start with trade and then let me move to healthcare and then immigration. I think those are the three topics that are illustrative of 
conservative thought and the way the Republican Party has decided to go instead. Trade, people say, oh, God, please don't talk about trade, right? Because right? Um, it's such a, it's an, an esoteric theory. But here, here's the heart of trade. The human being is designed to create. It's our most precious gift is to be creative. Um, it is what has made uh, great artwork. It's what has made great music. It is what has written great books. But it also makes great products and makes great services. The, the people's ability to create, to try to get people to, to part with their dollars to buy their product or their service over somebody else. And that has led to, in the aggregate, trillions of different transactions of all people competing for those dollars in the free market. And what trade does is it says, oh, your government decides we don't want you to buy these kinds of products or those kinds of products because, because of, of whatever reason, because they have different labor practices, they have different form of government, et cetera, et cetera. It's one thing to say, I don't want to buy products from a company because of Uyghur enslavement camps. And that, that is a real concern. That's a, that's a moral objective to buying Chinese products because of Uyghur labor camps. But in the broader sense, we have trade deficits with other countries, mostly China, precisely for the reason you have a trade deficit with your local supermarket, right? You keep buying stuff from them voluntarily. No one forces you to buy anything. Every, every free market trans transaction is a, is a voluntary transaction, is, is not a compulsory transaction. And they never buy anything back from you. <laughs> Which is a very interesting story about Hong Kong. The way Hong Kong comes into the British Empire is, is the British would trade with Hong Kong. They trade porcelain and they trade rice and other uh, agriculture products uh, from Hong Kong. Um, but the Chinese would wouldn't buy anything from the British. Nothing. It was, it was a one-way street. Sounds familiar, right? It's sort of the same way today. And for those products, they would only take silver. And it became a crisis in the British Empire because they were literally running out of silver because they were sending all their silver to Hong Kong. So the British came up with an idea and what it was was they were gonna sell to something, something to the Chinese that they couldn't resist. And it was opium and they sold opium to the Chinese. And they said, ah, but if you buy the opium, we only, we're so sorry, but we only take silver for the opium. And then began the great outflow of migration of silver from Hong Kong back to England, and meanwhile, millions of uh, uh, Chinese became addicted to opium, which led to two separate opium wars, which finally ended in a, years later in, a, in the British uh, treaty acquiring um, the 236 square miles of the Hong, greater Hong Kong territories. Hong Kong itself is very small. It's like seven miles by seven miles. But what the British gave, and I'm not advocating colonialism here, so don't, don't get all upset. Um, what I'm advocating is that what, what the British gave to the Chinese in Hong Kong was freedom. And, and what we're seeing today in, in Hong Kong is, um, is a pushback by the Chinese of that. They, they, don't, they know the goose is laying the golden eggs and they don't want to kill that golden egg, but they're about to do it. Uh, and Hong Kong has become one of the wealthiest places in the world because they simply got contract law, independent judiciary, um, military under civilian rule, they got elected leadership, they got freedom of press, freedom of religion, uh, con and all the rest of it. And, and you know, people say they want to take something out. Well, that's how Hong Kong became, because they don't have any natural resources. They don't have gold, they don't have silver, they don't have oil, they don't have natural gas. They've, they've got some fish and they had some agriculture, but they became wealthy because of the sheer creativity. Now, Donald Trump had renegotiated the South Korean trade agreement, which was called Chorus with a K. And it offered almost nothing significantly better than what the previous course agreement had had, despite his proclamations to the contrary. The one thing I could find in it that was significant was that Americans are not allowed to buy South Korean pickup trucks until 2032. And I thought to myself, well, what if I wanted to buy a South Korean pickup truck? I mean, what if the South Korean pickup truck is the truck that I need? What if it's the truck that I want? Why did why does my government want to keep me from buying South Korean pickup trucks? And when government interferes in the market in that way, they're propping up one or they're, they're picking winners and losers. So I'll give you an example. I was also very, and our trade policy, by the way, with China has led to the greatest farm welfare program we've ever seen. And it put the GM bailout 
uh, it dwarfed the GM bailout. It made it look tiny by comparison. The GM bailout was what, what Barack Obama had struck. And people say, well, the GM bailout was good because it saved the plant, saved the company, saved jobs. And that's all great. I, I don't begrudge that at all. And, um, and it made money. And all of, that is, all of that is true. But here's the problem. When, when your government decides to take your money and give it to a company and you don't get a service or product in return. In other words, I didn't get a GM car or truck or, or even a door handle or even a rear view mirror. I got nothing. Uh, but GM got the money. And it was all to save, in some sense, the Lordsville plant in Ohio. And the Lordsville plant is now closed. The reason it's closed is not because of unfair trade practices or labor laws in Mexico. The Lordsville plant is closed in Ohio because Americans didn't want to buy the Chevy Cruze. And they made the Chevy Cruze. And when they weren't buying the, the Chevy Cruze, they couldn't sell the Chevy Cruze. They went out of, they had to close the plant. Now that was painful, but when the, but here's the bigger problem and the, and the problem I like to focus on, which never gets talked about. All that money that went to GM arbitrarily or by, because of politicians decided it should go there didn't go to their competitors, didn't go to the upstart companies. Well, you can name some of them like Tesla and there's others who are actually designing cars that I might want to drive or, or that I might want to buy. And what we lose is we lose tomorrow's future innovation because the government literally took your money and sent it over and put money into a company that was failing. And I know that sounds harsh, but over time, why is it fair to take American consumers' money and give it to a company whose products or services that you don't actually consume. That's trade, that's a long, that's a long, I'll, sh I'll wrap up a little quicker on, 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 on healthcare. Um, I think the Republicans in short, in short, the, 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 the Democrats have always had a, a, a somewhat of an advantage in proposing policy solutions and it is this. The Democrats can always point to a, a large or massive government program and say, this is our answer to healthcare, right? Whereas the conservative and the, and the Republicans have been at a disadvantage by pointing to the private sector, which allows the Democrats to say, you see, they don't have a plan because it's not a government plan, right? You follow me, right? But here's the problem with the Republican plan. They didn't actually have a plan. There was no plan. There's still no plan. I think it was four weeks ago now when Donald Trump announced on Chris Wallace that he was gonna unveil a huge Healthcare plan. Well, have you seen that healthcare plan? There's, there is no healthcare. Healthcare is incredibly complicated. Um, and it isn't one thing. Obamacare, by the way, is just 7% of the market. That's 93% of the market is not Obamacare because you have private insurance, union insurance, you have TRICARE, you have Medicare, you have Medicaid, you have Indian health um, services. Um, it, is, it is extraordinarily complicated. Uh, and there's there's tons of money in healthcare. My argument with healthcare, there was actually no free market in healthcare, and I can explain that later if you'd like. Um, and then finally, on immigration, the, the conservatives, Ronald Reagan was pro-immigrants. His 1986 immigration reform bill uh, is a testimony to that. He was never anti-immigrant. The Republican Party has been never anti-immigrant. And what I say about, about immigrants is the fear that Trump generates, which is all encapsulated in the, in the mythology of, of, the, of the wall that Mexico didn't pay for. And by the way, Trump didn't build. It's, we have five new miles of wall. That's it. Um, but what, what the wall encapsulated was um, people who are fearful of two things, economic insecurity and the overwhelming of our culture. And I remind them, I say, well, you know, when the Italians came, we didn't all speak Italian. When the Irish came, we didn't all become Catholic. When the Jews came, we all don't worship in the temple. Uh, when the Germans came, we all, we all didn't have to learn German. And now the Muslims and the Hispanics are getting the same horrible treatment that we've always treated our immig immigration ways. So I don't suspect any of us who are non-Muslims will be worshiping or, or praying to Mecca in Spanish um, anytime soon. Um, no immigration wave of immigration has ever, over, have, has ever overwhelmed the American culture. It just has never happened in history. And quite the opposite. It's made our economy better and stronger. It's made us better as a nation, um, more innovative, uh, more uh, 
traditionally diverse. I'd argue that we're a, we're a monolithic American culture that people assimilate into, but people do bring uh, a lot into our country. Um, their ideas, their food, their traditions, it's wonderful. And why wouldn't we want to keep going in that direction? Why is it that we suddenly decide now? By the way, the, we might look at some of the low wage workers who happen to be uh, Latino and you've seen them, they work in construction, they may work in lawn care, they may be delivering your Amazon packages, they may work in restaurants. Um, their children will be doctors, lawyers, CEOs, and God forbid, congressmen. Because that's just the, that's just the way uh, immigration has always worked. People assimilate. I give people a quiz. I say, what does Nancy Pelosi and Rudy Giuliani have in common? Do you know what it is? I know John knows the answer. Do you know what it is, Elizabeth? I would guess that their parents are immigrants. They're both Italian Americans, but it doesn't come immediately to mind, even though their last names give them away. Um, because the Italians have so assimilated into our society, we just don't think of them as Italian. We think of them as Americans. And one day I'll say Rodriguez and Hernandez and give the same quiz and people will say, I don't know, I give up. Well, they're both Hispanic. Oh, I should have seen that. Yes, I should have seen that, I didn't see that. And we're getting closer to that every single day. But so I don't worry about the American culture and I certainly don't worry about economics because the next time there's a caravan coming, we should send buses and get them here as quickly as possible. Because if John and I are ever gonna realize there's social security and Medicare, somebody's gonna have to do all the work. And if we're ever gonna to get to three, four, five, and 6% GDP, we don't have enough Americans now to do the work. So we're gonna need lots of immigrants. Where do we, so that was trade, healthcare, and immigration. Do you wanna talk about the environment? Mm. Okay. Sure, now I'll let John talk about the environment. I, I have to admit my environmental chapter is a little snarky. Um, and my editor um, had a real problem with it. Um, there was more notes in the margin on this chapter by far than any other chapter. And I really delve into this. I first give a background on, on myself. I, still, I tell a story about uh, the Grand Canyon and why, and why it's my favorite place on earth and, and a little adventure I had there that was really amazing, like, amazing, like a God-given gift. And so you can read about that. And, you know, I, here at the Tyler household, we, um, we, we compost, we compost all our grass clippings, our leaf clippings, the cow manure, uh, all the organics that come out of the kitchen, everything gets recycled. Uh, I take the recycles personally to the recycle uh, center because I don't trust that the trash man is actually taking them there. <laughs> I just have this terrible suspicion that it's just getting mixed in with all the other trash. And, you know, it's all our efforts to, to uh, collate and separate and, and, and is, is not being met. So, so I, do I do recycle myself. Um, I love the environment. And I think it is just foolishness for the Republicans to cede the environment to the Democrats. Now, I make two recommendations, one to Democrats and one to Republicans. One, on the Republican side, the environment can be a great issue because it's a job creation issue because it's an innovation issue, because it's, a, it's such an exciting field. Um, and at the same time, if we can help the planet, that's a wonderful thing. I'm, I, I identify my, and on my side, of the Democratic side, I'm a little more critical of the, of, of the Democrats. I just think the, the foolishness of, of just dismissing the environment as not an important issue is just, just politically crazy. But on the Democrat side, I'm a little, I'm a little more harsh. And it's because I've had many conversations about the environment and, and it kind of always leads in the same direction. You know, oh, Rick, are you a scientist? No, I'm not a scientist. Is that okay? Can I still talk about, well, you know, it's really settled science. You know, you know if you're not a scientist, you're really not qualified to talk about this. And we, we go down and say, oh, okay, so I can't talk about it, right? And, but I, I don't identify myself. And then I'll say, well, if I say something about the, the environment in the most equivocal way, so let's say, I believe that global warming um, is occurring, that the earth is occurring. I'm, but I'm not entirely sure to the degree of which anthropomorphic, I can't pronounce it, anthro, John, help me out. Anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic um, climate change, that is man-made emissions are adding to, I don't know to what degree that's true. And 
when I look at the science, you know, they say that rocket science is hard and rocket science is actually by comparison easy because all the fixed variables are known. So that is, if I get to get a rocket in the space, I got to put fuel in it to create a certain amount of thrust. The fuel, the fuel weighs so much, my payload weighs so much, and I'm working against the force of gravity and I've got to get it into the air at a certain trajectory to meet, you know, into a certain orbit. Those are, I can't do that math. I'm not smart enough to do that math. But those are all known factors. And that's why we can dock up with the space station because we have very smart people who understand and know how to do that math. The environment's very different. There are, there are hundreds of variables and there may in fact be many variables that we don't, that there are hundreds of variables that are known, but there are also variables that are known, but we don't know what they are. And so we have to make estimations about the variables. And those, they're, and they're called guesses and that's fine. And we may be guessing right, and that's fine. That's good. I hope so. Or maybe not. Maybe I don't. Maybe I hope we're not because some of the conclusions are rather catastrophic. Um, but there may be unknown variables, and so it is a very difficult thing to predict. Um, and so one of the things I always get in trouble with is, is when people talk to me about the environment, they they always refer to the weather. And then I will make an example about the weather. Like for instance, Hurricane Laura went from a, a hurricane a one category to three overnight and nobody predicted that. Oh, but Rick, that's a weather event. You can't talk about the weather to make a case about climate change. But wait, you just did. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and then if I say, but I'm not sure, and I say it in the most equivocal way, I believe that, that we may be warming the planet and I, I'm concerned about it and I think we should prudently do something about it. They'll say I'm a denier. You've heard that word, climate denier. That means I don't believe in climate change. Well, I just told you I did, but because I'm a denier, I must not believe. Those are, to me, those are religious terms. Those are, those are doctrinal terms. That's like arguing with me about the virgin birth. We can't do it because that's what I believe as a Christian. And it, it, there's no sense discussing it because you won't convince me otherwise. And sometimes when I feel like I talk to the left about the environment, that I can't talk about it because it's a belief that's doctrinal. And there's, they're based on, a doctrine that somehow exists and it's in religious terms and I can't have a discussion about it. Um, so I think, I mean, the, the Democrats could win on the environment just the same way I recommended the Democrats could win on the environment, but they've got to drop the henny penny, meaning we're all going to die in 20 years because they said that 20 years ago, we haven't died and people should begin to lose credibility. And when I hear that, you know, we're, we have to fix it or 12 years, it's not fixable and, and it's all going to be terrible. I don't know that it's going to be terrible and in 12 years we're going to find out and I hope it's not. Um, but it just seems, it just seems to me that scaring people about the environment for long term is not a good political strategy because people just begin not to believe it because it's so big. But talking about the environment in positive terms of protecting the environment, creating jobs of the future, I think is a very exciting field and I think that's the way we should go about it. And I think that's in the end far better for environmentalism. Um, than, you know, crying, you know, the sky is falling. John? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, in the book, there's a story of a man named Nick Kalaniak, and this is, he has an interesting uh, background. His family apparently didn't have a lot of money growing up. So when he would, you know, ask his father or complain to his father, dad, I don't have this, I'd like this. His father had an interesting response. His father's response was, go make it, go make one. I don't have a bike, we'll go make one. So he came up with, uh, essentially developed the LED technology. And so instead of, you know, we had sort of the government light bulbs that everybody really liked so much for quite a long time, right? Well, he invented the LED bulb, which now you can have, you know, I guess pretty much any color of the rainbow. Uh, the energy is used for light as opposed to heat. Uh, it's much more efficient, it's cheaper, they last forever. I don't remember replacing an LED bulb. So I think from a conservative perspective, it's, it's clearly not the case that we don't appreciate the environment, as Rick was saying. I mean, as a Christian, I'm looking at it as a Christian, it's that God, God wants us to care for the earth. Um, I would regard that as, a, as, as you know, God's command to me to, to care for the earth. But I think that the answer is supply side. I mean, if, if as with uh, as with cre the creativity, the answer lies in the creativity of man. 
and I think too much the the we look at things as the as sort of man-made problems. There are there are man-made answers. The reality of it is is that what's the next LED bulb? LED bulb. What what idea would that be? I mean, I've looked at the numbers and they're in the book in there. The amount of energy that is saved every year with the LED bulbs, it's 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 incredible. I mean, it's like the greatest thing ever to save energy. Well, what's the next thing going to be? Well, here's my guess. My guess is that someone is coming up with it now. Maybe it's it's somebody who's having a conversation with his dad, and the dad or mom, and they're saying, "Oh, go make one." Right? That's how things happen. And and I think that by unleashing the creativity of man, maybe that's the best way to address what ails the environment. Is simply so let's let supply side operate, as opposed to the government says, "Okay, let's go do this." Our belief is things don't happen too efficiently by doing it that way, putting, putting a government committee in charge of it. The greatest inventions didn't happen by government committee. I think that's a fair way to say it, or at least it doesn't seem to be that way. So I think that's, I think that's where the answer lies. It's in the creativity of men. I think that's a good place to, to insert also this counter thought, which is, and I agree with John, that the creativity of man has solved more, more problems than, than government does. But there, but I think John and I also agree that there is a role for, for government in, in, in areas where there is no natural um, incentive um, to create. So for instance, um, the LED bulb was actually, was, was a government, was a gun, it was a government contract. The government contract went to the private sector to solve the problem. What they needed was, a, was an indicator that didn't, that didn't produce heat. And, it, it, and this is how the LED got invented. Um, but, the government does do some things extraordinarily well. We talked about the moonshot or, you know, or the space station. Um, you know, the government did get us to the moon. That was an incredible effort. And there was no natural market to go and explore the moon. So there are things that the government can do. There's basic science. And we talk about this uh, in, the, in, the, in the chapter on healthcare. Um, government does an enormous amount of work in research that leads to the development of drugs. and, and and, and the private sector, in my opinion, unfairly profits from that. And that probably needs to be rebalanced or there needs to be some licensing or, but it's, it's unfair that taxpayers pay an enormous amount into NIH, National Institutes of Health, National Institutes of Science. Uh, and they, they, they do ultimately reap the benefit, but they don't, reap, they don't reap the profits from them. And I don't want the government to become a profit because people, a profit, enterprise. It's not. That's why we don't need a CEO or businessman to run it, frankly. Um, but there, the, the, the government does amazing work in doing basic science at the, at the private sector. And the internet is, is a perfect example. It started as ARPANET or DARPANET, which was the way the Pentagon protected, um, you know, the nuclear codes so they could send them around the world and they wouldn't be, you know, physically stuck in one place. And, and that developed over time into the internet. Well, no one even imagined what the internet would have been like um, at, at you know at that time and and so so yes government uh, can and the last example I'll use is is the pandemic because I get asked this a lot in, in healthcare well Rick what if we if we had a national healthcare system then we would obviously be able to deal better with this pandemic and that that may be true um, I think that I think the pandemic had to be dealt with on a national level because it required a national response. It was, it's a national health crisis and it cannot be dealt with uh, on an ad hoc state by state, city by city, town by town level. It needs a coordinated effort. And as far as I understand it, that effort was actually in place at the beginning of the Trump administration. It was dismantled uh, and was never really, really reassembled and was just punted to the states. And, and that's why our numbers are so dramatically bad as compared to the rest of the world. To give you an example, the, our death rate of, of the United States is 20 times worse than all the Asian countries combined, 20 times worse. Um, and it's twice that of, it's twice that of Europe. Um, so we are really way behind the eight ball on this because we didn't respond uh, to a national pandemic in a coordinated national way. I think we have time for about one more question. And I think I might have John lead with this one. You mentioned you have a very large family. How do yes. you recognize large political differences in personal relationships? Mm. Perhaps 
in <laughs> marriage or in parents or siblings, how, if you are a conservative, how do you reconcile relationships with persons who disagree with you? Well, that's a really great question. I, I actually like to hear the other side. I mean, I, I, I invited, um, I, it's it's funny. There's Rick was mentioning it's a coffee shop. We sometimes get together to to speak at. I mean, I invite those. I like to hear the other sort of the other side of things. I, I think that I think that one of the things that's happened uh, lately. I think this is it's gotten worse lately. Maybe it was there twenty or thirty years ago. I didn't notice it as much, but um, people sort of really define themselves politically. I don't think that's super healthy. I think what we need to do is. Uh, try to, I mean, friendships are more important. I think Rick's actually talked about this a few times, the fact that we can get together and disagree. Rick and I, I don't think we agree on everything. <laughs> so we, you know, it's, and that's okay. But the reality of it is, is that I, I like to keep the friendship in place and it's not, it's not worth that. There are gonna be things we disagree about. Um, you know, if I'm a Browns fan and, and Rick is a Patriots fan, that's okay. Maybe we see plays differently, right? And so, but, I Rick think is a Patriots fan. What's that? Rick is a Patriots fan. That's, a, that's right. So, but the reality of it is, is that we have to, instead of shouting each other down, we need to listen better. You know, I, and I think, I think it all really starts there because we're not going to get anywhere until we do. Because we're not winning, as I say, winning over our hearts and minds is important, but, but listening, we should listen. Because as, as I say, we don't know everything. We're trying to adapt things too and try to figure out does this make more sense? And and I think that we have to stop doing that. We have to we have to focus on the friendship and realize there are things we could disagree about and that's okay. It really is. And yourself, Rick? I you know, I say in the book that uh, relationships are more important important than politics and they are. Uh, your relationship with your family, your relationship with your friends, you know, you want to preserve them really at all costs. And if your friend can't talk about politics with you in a way that's, uh, you know, that's not going to preserve your friendship, then you should agree to just not talk about politics. I have friends uh, who are Trump supporters, and uh, we just don't talk about it. We, they, they may come to dinner. They haven't since COVID, but before that. And, but we just find a million other things. There's a million other things to talk about uh, besides, besides politics. And, you know, I often get on, on on Twitter, you know, occasionally I'll, I'll have a follower who say, I just can't stand it anymore. I just, this is driving me crazy. And I, I've often responded many times to say, turn the news off, take a few days off, stay away from social media for a few days, clear your head, connect with nature, because it's really helpful. It's, I think there's a deep connection human beings desire uh, to have with nature um, and get some perspective and get healthy because we need you to come back. But you know, if you find yourself uh, just getting, you're, you're, you're going crazy because of all the, the news and the news is just, it's nonstop. I mean, there's, it's, it's, um, it's too much and people need to take a break and, and sort out what's important and, and sort out those priorities. Um, so my book may not do that for you, but uh, maybe there might be a chapter or two that might, <laughs> that might calm you down. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, the both of you, for joining us this evening. Rick's book, Still Right, is available from Gibson's Bookstore. We do have signed book plates, which we are including with orders, and it is available for pickup at curbside in browsing, or we do happily ship all over the country and all over the world. Thank you very much, Rick Tyler, John Clark. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.